Revelation 5. Revelation 5, verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. <clears throat> we'll talk about that next class. I think it'll be the next class <clears throat> that we'll get into a few of the explanations of that. The one that is real obvious, though, is that he is described as a lamb, and he was called by John the Baptist. One time he was called, Behold the Lamb of God. The other time by John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. <clears throat> Um, uh, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, so in John's imagery here of, of the lamb in the midst of the throne uh, relates to two things. And some of these things I mentioned in one of my classes, it may sound like I'm repeating, but I was actually remembering what I had written in other places and, and saying it, so I'll just read this. Uh, paragraph. <clears throat> John's imagery of a lamb in the midst of the throne depicts two things. First, it shows us the helplessness and the lack of defensive weapons had by a little lamb. When the scriptures describe Jesus as a lamb as though slaughtered, it is speaking of the lamb as bearing the signs and scars of defeat by crucifixion. When you see the lamb as though he had been slaughtered, that's a picture of Christ crucified. It's the, it's, it's the scars and the, the blood and the defeat of Jesus on the cross. I think we all know that, but, you know, I think we all know that theologically that Jesus is the lamb and he died. But it's kind of different when you go, gee, you know what? I'm not just looking at a lamb on a, in the midst of the throne or whatever. I'm looking at the crucified Christ. Does that make sense? Because that's what it is, you know. Whether it makes sense to our human mind doesn't matter. That's what that is a picture of. Bless you. I just blessed your daughter, Sharon. <clears throat> By the way, Kelly, is your mom on there? Mary, thank you so much for all the cards and support and blessings and handwritten notes and things that you've done over the years. You're just one of, one of the people that continually lift up my arms, and I just want to thank you for it. Um, <clears throat> all right. Here's the way I wrote this. For God the Son to choose the symbol of the Lamb above all other mascots. That's not a mascot, but I, I couldn't think of the best word, but I, I thought that would help you to know that's kind of identifies his team, <laughs> his mascot. Yes. Yeah. So the lamb is our That's who we are and we stand for. Were y'all able to get that? Because it was so profound. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm far off, but not that far off. Is that? <laughs> I, I knew that. I knew that. <clears throat> All right. So this lamb represents, um, to represent him is to show willing impotence and vulnerability. Willing. Okay. Now that's different, folks. That's different. Jesus is the son of God. He's got all power. He could call 10,000 angels. You got to understand, this is not somebody who's been trapped and can't, you know, this is, you know, I, you, you picture of these Superman show or whatever and, you know, they, they, use um, kryptonite to, you know, break down Superman, and he's going, oh, I'm strong, but not against kryptonite, folks. They didn't, there was no kryptonite stronger than Jesus. He willingly 
became vulnerable and as it were, and I'm sorry, it's not, maybe not the best word, but impotent in the sense of not using the power that he has, and he did that willingly. When extended to us, it shows God's power at work in the weak and the powerless, downtrodden ones who look beyond their own weakness unto his weakness and powerlessness and the result that it brings because we all need to make a clear distinction between our weakness and powerlessness and Christ's because it is not about just being weak you know it's not about you know it's not about being weak and sick and powerless I mean you know India's got 800 million people in a very small area um, if it was about being weak and powerless and sick and you know all this stuff poor then they would be the most spiritual nation on the planet. It's not about being that, it's about Christ's willingness in us to lay down our lives, to lay down our weapons, to lay down our tools. Does, does it make sense? To, to beat our weapons into plowshares so that we can have the seed coming forth instead of using those things to defeat other people. Our efforts and our tools are being used toward an increase of Christ. Not, you know, what does it say? And they won't study war no more. No more. We always say that, and the lion shall lay down with the lamb. Of course, there's no scripture that says that. You know that, right? Nowhere. <laughs> Check it out. I dare you. <clears throat> but we always say that. We got pictures of it, and we, you know, <laughs> there's all this stuff. It's like, uh, you know, I read the Bible. It seemed to me like I remember it saying, uh, you know, anyway. <clears throat> I won't spoil your fun of proving me wrong as you get in there and show, it, show me what it really says. <clears throat> All right. Um, however, Christ's crucifixion was not primarily about defeat, and its meaning for us was beyond just suffering. Okay. We're not talking about just suffering. I know, I know uh, people... Um, that are spiritual and whatever, and, and they talk, they're always talking about suffering, but it's not just suffering. It's only one kind of suffering. It's the kind of, it's, you know what, I'll just say it. It's, it's the sufferings of Christ. And folks, the sufferings of Christ was that he had all power and all ability to do something and refused to do it because he believed life comes out of death and he was willing to die so that we would win. That's the kind of suffering he went through. So it's not just, you know, well, I don't have enough money to pay my bills, so I know God's pleased with Jesus in me because I'm suffering or something. It's not just suffering for suffering's sake. There, if it's not, as it were, like a sponge filled with Christ, then it's just us going through stuff. And, and our goal, folks, isn't to suffer. Our goal is Christ. And our willingness is to suffer for others as long as they get the Lord. Amen? All right. So the cross is the symbol of suffering, suffering one's attempts to change and control things. Because you do. You have instruments of war you have instruments of getting your own way you have things that you can do uh, this this is one you know the, this is one reason why the t scriptures talk about the you know the problem with money mammon unrighteous filthy lucre you know whatever word you want to use um, and but the problem isn't the money. The problem is the power that it has or the power that it gives us to do things. Well, now I can get back at somebody or now I can do this or now I can, 
you know, I mean, some people go, well, now I'm going to go out and buy me a car and, you know, make the other guy look like an idiot or buy some nice clothes and make her look, you know, I don't know. I and mean, we, we use things to win all the time. <clears throat> um, so the cross is the, is the symbol of suffering one's attempts to change and control things. And they surrender to that by accepting punishment that is undeserved. It, and the punishment may be, um, I'm going to slap you, Jesus, because if I really thought you were the son of God, you know, I, you, I think you'd kill me, but you seem weaker than me, and I'm stronger than you. Is that, is that, I hope I made that clear, but I'm, it's like, you know, they would never do that if they knew that, you know, if he had all the outshining, there were the 10,000 angels behind him. They would never have slapped Jesus. Never. So he reduces all that down and says, well, let's see what's in you. And we see what's in, what, we see what's in us. But thank God we have Christ in us here. You know, we have Jesus. And we can, we can go beyond learning doctrine and deep things. Man, I mean, you know, I am not interested in just learning deep things to impress people. And I'll tell you what, there was a time that I was. I mean, I, I really got a kick out of, you know, wowing the, 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 the crowd, you know, with what I knew. That's, now I look back on that and I'm just ashamed to the bone over my spirit and all of that. But at the time it was like, wow, look what God's making me. You know, the orphan boy. <laughs> and see, even that, we got all kind of stuff working in us. We don't even know why or what. <clears throat> all right, so... Um, Jesus never resisted their death that they had planned and prepared for him. I mean, think about it. He never resisted their death. I mean, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He could have prayed it away, first of all. Second of all, he could have called 10,000 angels. He's, he's telling them all this, you know. And, you know, why is he telling them that? He's not trying to impress them or, you know, convince them that he's the Son of God. He's doing it for our sake that we'll know that he did still have power and could have done that and didn't do it because he's more the lamb than he is one who makes war. Hmm? Blessed are the peacemakers. Okay, so he never resisted the death they had prepared for him. The best characterization of Christ crucified speaks of weakness unto death rather than self-protection from death. Okay, now, you know, when we talk about death, we're not just talking about physical death. We're talking about the death to our powers to do things. We're talking about dying to self in those things, not, not resorting to resources that are not the Lord. You know, I, you know, this is going to sound silly to some of y'all, maybe just ridiculous, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> before I came to the Lord, you know, it, it was like the Lord had just blessed my life even then with so many, you know, things and a lot of things just went my way. And it always seemed like when I was thrown up in the air, I was like a cat, I'd land on my feet and not everybody around me did. And, and I remember just having a sense of something that wasn't the Lord, but it carried me above so many things. And I remember when the Lord first dealt with, started dealing with me about the life of Christ within me and, it, and, and to, in a real way, stop playing with this and let it be the life of Christ in me. And he said, one of the first things you're going to have to do is give up that whatever, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it like this, and don't think I'm an idiot, but I am, but, you know, it was like, it was like the superpower that I had. I had a superpower that others didn't have, and I could get by where others couldn't get by, and I could, you know, you could say get your way or whatever, but mine wasn't particularly just about getting my way, but it made a, but it made a way. <clears throat> 
And he said, you're going to have to give that up because that's not me. And, you know, first thing for me to realize was that wasn't him. <laughs> Second thing was, you know, and this is what I said to the Lord. I said, Lord, if I give that up, I'm going to end up being a mortal man like everybody else. And I didn't want to be mortal. <laughs> Again, y'all can think I'm just, but I'm just telling you, you know, good thing about hearing from me is you know you're going to get it straight whether you like it or not but i said yes to the lord and for the longest time it was not good i didn't like living as a mortal but he said i will replace what was you with me and it'll be better than be having superpowers. It'll be me. He was right, and it happened. And I am so thankful that it happened because I was so wrapped up in that whatever it was, and it just carried me and all that stuff. It's just not the Lord and wasn't the Lord. And, and, uh, and now, and I remember thinking, it's going to take a long time to get through this. I don't know how to get, because it had become me you understand it was part of me how do you get rid of something that is is you do you, you know i mean there's there's things that are like parasites on you or stuff in your pocket that you but when you realize god's asking for something that's not something i got it's something that is really basically me that's like a tough deal and i say it's going to take a long long time and i remember thinking man I just don't know, you know, if God can do this and whatever. Well, he did do it, and it's gone, you know. And now I'm happy, happy with Jesus. I'm just fine with Jesus. Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient. I'm glad for Jesus. <clears throat> and I know all of y'all have gone through different things, maybe not described the way that I did, but different things like that. We're, we, we're all pressing towards the Lord. But, you know, the closer you get to the Lord, the more junk falls off of you, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to reread that sentence. The best characterization of Christ crucified speaks of weakness unto death rather than self-protection from death. The act of laying down demonstrates acceptance rather than seeking to turn the attack. Laying down, you know, are you familiar with the term laying down your life? Where did that term come from? Is that uh, a, a new creation terminology we use around here or is that in the Bible? Yeah, well, hopefully, if it's terminology we use, it's because of something we believe from the Word of God. I would hope, God help if it's not, but you know, you know I'm always changing up our terminology to keep that from happening anyway. But laying down, laying down, I mean, even the concept of, of that and the way that that sounds, uh, as I wrote, demonstrates acceptance rather than seeking to turn the attack. Man, to turn the attack, to turn the attack, to turn this or that, to turn the oppression that's going on when the Bible declares Jesus to be a lamb and a sheep before his shearers, it is a reference to the fact that he was vulnerable. Jesus was willingly weak. And he was vulnerable and he emptied and emptied of divine power, of all power, as a resource and appeared as weak and foolish to outsiders. Now, answer me this. Don't you think the angels thought, well, this is really dumb. Those people are, you know, they're all Adam down there, and they are a threatening race, you know. Anybody ever watch that show, um, Battlestar Galactica? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's like the, you got the Cylons, which are basically machines that look like people, and you got the people. And up till like the latter end of the thing, the machines get along fine, but the people are so petty that it's incredible. It's like, you know, 
They're running for their lives. There are only a small group of them left that, it, that the whole human race is tied up in 5,000 people. And they're fighting over the most petty things. You're just going, I, I remember saying, I hope the Cylons win. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens? You get almost to the end and they're fighting. I'm going, yeah, we made them all right. <laughs> yep, that's something we made because now it's just like us, ripping and tearing it themselves. We'll never defeat them. They'll rip themselves apart. They'll never defeat us. We'll rip ourselves apart. And I mean, it's just, it's like, oh, please. I mean, you know, you read the next title, you know, and it's just like, well, somebody didn't like, you know, there was a spoon left in the kitchen or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's almost that petty and you're just going, you know, really? Really? You know, this is, we, we really, we really want to save the human race, you know? No, we want uh, to be a new creation, a new race. And that's really another translation some of you have heard me use. If any man be in Christ, he is a new species. Amen is right. Amen. And that's good news. But now let's conform to him. You know, we can, we can say the doctrine of that forever, can't we? But let's conform. Let's conform to the image of Christ. You see what I mean? I mean, I know, I know some of us are still barely learning the teaching of this. But your heart can never, um, you can never replace Conforming to Christ with conforming your brain to the doctrine of Christ crucified. Don't do it. It ain't worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, However, there is also one thing to be noted in this picture. We also see the lamb as seated upon the, the, or is, what is it? We also see the lamb in the midst of the throne. I like that better. <clears throat> Shay was making a point to me. May I say this? Okay. Shay was making a point to me that it really never says that it's a lamb on the throne. It's the lamb in the midst of the throne. And, um, you know, whether I or he or anybody understands that, the scriptures never fail to have a reason for saying things, you know. And uh, maybe our wording, and I'm not saying that it is, but I'm saying maybe our wording of the lamb on the throne is a secret uh, foray back into the wisdom of this world, lamb on the throne. You know what I mean? De declaring who's the boss, even though it's a slain lamb. Yeah, but who's the boss? Where there's lamb in the midst of the throne. It doesn't give you that freedom to declare, yeah, we won. It, it's not shouting that, it, and it's not opening the door to a wrong spirit. <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> Uh, the, the lamb in the midst of the throne, this conveys to us that the lamb is not totally devoid of power. He has the power, but he's slain. His strength and power lies in his selflessness. It's what God honors. It's the selflessness of it. That's what God honors. So what do we mean by that? Uh, an example might be to turn the other cheek is an act of faith and a release of power. To do so shows that we are not cowards but strong, strong in the power of the weakness of God. Can anybody see that? Jesus is the one who told us to turn the other cheek. Well, why would he do that? You know? Um, but... I stated, maybe to do that is an act of faith, that there's a release of power when we are selfless and we don't strike back and we don't add to, you know, 
you hit me and I hit you. You know what I mean? It's uh, what is what is the saying from the old covenant? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You let that keep going and there'll be nothing but blind, toothless people on the planet. Right? You know, that's the end of that. Because we will, somebody hit, you know, I mean, that's it. You know, this person hit me, I hit them. This person, you know, I hit them, they hit me. Pretty soon everybody's hitting one another, knocking their eyes out. We're all blind, just, just swinging in the dark, trying to hit somebody to show we've got power, to show we've got influence, to show we've got something, some say in the matter. Okay, but um, Jesus, uh, again, here's what I believe. I believe Jesus taught all this stuff, and we thought he was trying to teach us to be that way, when in reality he was describing himself. I'm glad all of y'all got that. I'll never repeat it again. Strike it from the record. I don't believe Jesus taught that stuff to teach us. Because he was the one who was going to turn the other cheek. He was the one that was going to take this, the lowest seat. He was the one. He taught, what, he taught them what he was going to do. And I'll tell you what, that's what I try to do. I don't try to do this to teach you to do that necessarily, especially not towards me. But it is what you can expect from me towards you. Okay? Well, where did I get that from? Jesus. And see, if it's true of Jesus, then his plan isn't to teach us the truths of his nature. His plan is to give us his nature and we will learn the truths by him through us. We'll find ourselves, has this ever happened to somebody that something bad happened and you know you were gonna have a confrontation with somebody and either on the phone or you know whatever uh, in person or whatever and you you know I'm ready man I'm upset and I'm, I got my rights and, da, 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 da. and you get in that situation and you just turn the other cheek and you just are as puzzled as, you know, you are as puzzled as yourself. <laughs> and you're going, what the heck? Could I, I was going to really, I would have won too. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was going to, and you're just like, but you know it's the Lord. And you're going, well, what didn't happen is you got in that situation, saw them and, and went, Oh, yeah. Ding. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. That never happens. Not in the heat of the moment. You know what I mean? A teaching, a scripture doesn't go, bling. Okay. Uh, remember Matthew? So and so and so. You got to do it now. Ready? Do it. It doesn't happen that way. What happens is the life that is Christ comes out of you. And then you think of the scripture afterwards. Usually. And you go, that was Jesus. And it's, an, it's nice, isn't it, to say, that was not I, but Christ living in me. It's nice to say that. How often do we get to really say that? Maybe not as much as we want. <laughs> but when we do, it's nice. You go, praise God, you know. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for saving that person from having their bowels cut out and fed to them. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Um, we may be uh, weak in appearance, but we're not ineffective. Okay. The the weakness of God is not the lack of power. It is the most powerful thing there is. Life comes out of death. It is, it, it's the cross, it's the, it's the, that, that death. Folks, life doesn't come out of death in anything except Jesus' death and us united with him in that death. If you've been buried by baptism into his death, you shall be. It's his death. And it's the only one life comes out of. You, there is no other death 
So death isn't the answer. It's being united with Christ in his death and manifesting that, bearing about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Not just dying, not just suffering. My God, we're not talking about that. We're talking about, and we're not talking about something that's just weak. It appears weak. Jesus appeared weak standing there. You know, you remember the story of uh, Elisha and uh, and the, his, his uh, minister that was there with him and said, I saw all the chariots of the enemies surround him. And, and, he, sa and, and he said, oh, God, we, you, know, we, you know, boss man, what are we going to do here? And we're in trouble. And he, he says, Lord, open his eyes. Open my guy's eyes. Not open their eyes to see this. Open the people who ought to be seeing this already. Open their eyes. And when they did, there's all these chariots there. Well, what if Jesus is standing there with, you know, I don't know if you know the number 10,000, but if you could picture 10,000 angels behind him, swords drawn. I mean, I, I'm just remembering a few of them where there was an angel with a sword drawn and it was powerful, you know. And Jesus you know, now if Jesus is saying to, to this little mob, let's say there's 20 guys come with torches and stuff to take Jesus out of the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? It's a little mob with clubs and stuff, you know, we're going to get you, Jesus, you know. And, um, and then he goes, Bring! and behind him, as far as you can see, filling up that whole thing and halfway up the Mount Zion, is 10,000 angels, and he said, I could sick 10,000 angels on you. They would go, oh, my God. Well, what if they were there just like they were in Elisha's day? You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, what if they really were there? But he chose not to frighten them or whatever because that's not what he was going to resort to. He's got power. And he could use 10,000 angels, but he's got another power that's even stronger than that, and that's the power of life out of death. That's the power of selflessness. Okay? It's the nature of God. It's the divine nature that we've been given. <clears throat> so, um, let me make sure I got this now. Okay, so we may, we may be weak in appearance, but we're not ineffective. Turning the other cheek may not always change the heart of the one who did the slapping, but it releases God's power and weakness. If nothing else, it proves that you have come under the government of the Lamb upon the throne, in the midst of the throne. By turning the other cheek and all that it signifies, you give up on the urge to control things, but lay down the power available to you to turn your own captivity. You do not use it. You have mercy on your oppressor by not using whatever powers you had have against them. It is an act of abandonment of power along with an embracing of the, powerless, the powerlessness as known in Christ crucified. To accept Christ in this way frees from the need for self-concern. Self-concern's huge. I mean, that's why we resort to all this stuff. That's why we talk back. That's why we, you know, you know what I mean? Self-concern, yeah. Well, I was kind of meditating on the verse you mentioned earlier about meeting our weapons in the plowshares. And I, was just, I just wrote something down here. We beat our weapons in the plowshares not because there is no enemy, but because that is the way of the cross, the way of the yeah. And notice it didn't say we, we beat our enemies into plowshares. <laughs> we beat our, and our, our enemies into a stupor. No. Well, I never really thought of those verses in terms of, well, the enemies are all defeated now, so we can beat our, you know, <laughs> our weapons into plowshares. Yeah. That's not what it says. No, I study no war no more, man. Something's changed, and it's a, it's a great change. It's a true change. It's not a, it's not a theological change. It's an internal change. When you start beating your own weapons into instruments for increasing the seed instead of defeating everybody else, happy days are here. <clears throat> All right, so we show the world that we are one with Christ, that we are one with Christ crucified. We are not the crucifier. 
We are not the crucifiers. We are not. We're not what? Okay, repeat after me. We are not the crucifiers. All of this weakness is nothing more than lamb power in an outward manifestation. Lamb power. You know that's what the book of Revelation is about, don't you? Okay. How much time we got? I'm going to try to cover some more of this then. I'm making some good ground, but I do have about four paragraphs left. All right, the process begins like this. First, or number one, you give up the desire to control every situation. Easier said than done. But it's necessary. You can't, you can't go anywhere <laughs> unless you do that because you're always controlling everything. You know what I mean? I mean, you just, there's no way that you can make any progress. And anything that you would call progress without giving that up is not progress at all. Okay. So the process begins like this. First, you give up the desire to control every situation. Now, notice the wording. It didn't say you give up every situation. It said you give up the desire. You probably won't give up controlling every situation, but you are in the process of desiring not to um, be Lord, be the Lord. You want Jesus to be Lord. All right, then you give up whatever methods you would use that are based on control. That's beating your your weapons into plowshares. You, you give up whatever methods you would use that are based on control. Finally, you give up the power. The resigning from the use of these things is due to the fact that that kind of power is not God's way. You become open to God's reality, his means of empowerment. It is a defeat, the defeat of fear and insecurity. Because we say that, you know, we say, well, the cross was a defeat. Well, if the, if the cross is working in you, if you actually give up, then, then there's something else that's being defeated here. Fear and insecurity is being defeated in you. That's a big victory. Did you know that? I mean, there are, you know, there are a lot of, lot of tribes and a lot of things that Israel had to defeat, and some bigger than others. The, the children of Anak, you know, the giants and all that stuff. There are some that are way bigger than others. And, and to be able to defeat fear and insecurity as you trust the Lord, that's big. Perfect love casts out fear. All right. But if your comprehension of things is based upon the wisdom of this age, not on the cross wisdom, not on the hidden wisdom, then by all outward appearances, the lamb was a failure. By all outward appearances, the greatest power in the known world, exemplified by the Roman Empire, soundly defeated the Jewish Messiah and hung him on a cross in a most shameful way. Remember, Rome was viewed as a beast in the book of Daniel. Did, did you remember that? Book of Daniel. Rome, there, is viewed as a beast. Um, and Rome hung Jesus on the cross just as surely as did the Jews. Then, if a Jewish council defeated Jesus or the Roman Empire brought his ruin, what chance does the slaughtered lamb have against all principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness? And how does this slaughter give us power to overcome? Well, the overcoming has to first be over the stuff in us, not what's outside of us. To control our own everything, to, to, to have our own way, or to, you know, to, uh, um, you know, to be constantly fretting over, well, they did this, or why did he do that, or why is she, you know, or why does this go in this direction, or whatever. It's all of this stuff that needs to be defeated in us. And let me tell you something. The lamb 
you know, remember it talks about that in uh, Revelation 14, and they that follow the, la the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, right? Well, his first goal is not to defeat the beast. Okay, uh, I, did, I did a quick study sitting in the car the other day. I went through the book of Revelation, and I looked up every scripture that had to do with all the bad stuff the beast was doing. Folks, it was about a, I don't know, a chapter and a half at the most. Yeah, I mean, I dare you to go through there. It's, we think it's full of all this horrible stuff that there's almost nothing, almost nothing about him. But then go back through and look at all the stuff God's losing. We'll get into that. I don't want to jump too far ahead. But I will say that the defeat that God's trying to bring about first, because he can, you know, if it's a power struggle, God's got way more power than the devil, right? If it's just simply a power struggle, he could just knock him on the head and it'd be over with. All right? And, and, and that's when you find it. I mean... Gosh, there's so much I, you know, I don't want to say, but, yeah, you know, if you look in like Revelation 19, right up to the defeat of the enemy and stuff, by that time, he has pretty much got his people conforming to him as a lamb. Once that's settled, man, he just goes and, it's just nothing. It's not a big fight. I'll show you when we get there. It's just like, and the war, and they got ready on this side, you know, in Armageddon, and they got ready on this side, and the Lord just took the beast and he put him in the, that's what it says. I mean, that's the way it ends. It's not like, and they fought and tumbled in their asses, and they got ready, and the beast thinks he's really going to end, and they took him, and they just put him in, you know, put him in the, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, if it was only about God and the beast, he could have done that at the very beginning of the book of Revelation. He's trying to bring something out of this mess, and it's those that will be conformed to him. All right. So that's, that's one of the main reasons why there has to be a surrender of your fear and of your need to control based on your insecurities. Let's see. <clears throat> so how does this slaughter give us power to overcome? The answer is simple. From this failure flows forgiveness to the true criminals, such as Saul of Tarsus. This can be seen. That, remember, Stephen was defeated. He lost. But somebody's sitting there named Saul of Tarsus who becomes the Apostle Paul becomes the greatest minister of the reality of this crucified way that there ever was. <clears throat> and remember, Stephen had all this ability and power. He could do, you know, miracles and all this stuff. Man, he was the top guy. I, I would have said, why, Lord, did you take the best? Why did you take the brightest, the youngest, the most anointed? It says that. He was anointed to preach. It was powerful. Why did you... Why did you allow them to kill the best and the brightest? He goes, I, I don't care about best and brightest. I found a lamb. He's, he's there stoning him. It says he's looking up and his face shines like an angel. He's looking at Jesus. He's looking at the resurrected lamb, the one who died. He's looking at him going, this is the way. This will do more than leaving me alive on this planet doing great things for God. <clears throat> this can be seen by Jesus' words on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. It can also be seen in the fact that for all his persecutions against Jesus, against Jesus' body, Saul of Tarsus should have been destroyed by God. Instead, he brought him up close to his heart and revealed to him his deepest secrets. His ways are not our ways that he took the very one that was persecuting him and won the victory by his death over this enemy. 
<clears throat> and manifested it through Stephen. In love, Jesus dies for his oppressors. However, the scriptures do not show Jesus showing love so much by means of kind words, facial expressions, or intimate moments as much as by laying down his life, 1 John 3, 16. Therefore, we see that from the cross came his most intimate expressions of love as, as, a, as exemplified in these sayings. Father, forgive them. This day in paradise thou shalt be with me. Woman, behold your son. Listen to all the intimacy of that. All coming from the cross. All coming from self-giving, selflessness. And yet, somehow we miss those things. All right, let's just close. We'll, next class, we'll get a little more into <clears throat> the description of Jesus in Revelation 5, and then the one following that one will be the one I promised we'd have tonight and misplace my notes. Father, we just ask you to continue to prepare us for the rest of the book. May we be right with you in your timing, not held by class numbers or whatever, but to finish out what it is you want to say. Open our hearts. Open our hearts more to the, that slaughtered lamb that you have placed in the midst of the throne. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.